Hi, this is Chaplain Greg with The Wandering Wesleyan, and we're back again for another episode in Walk in the Word. And uh, if you like this video series, please like and subscribe. Love to see some comments in the comment section. So uh, if you have some thoughts, write, uh, write them in the comment section. Love to interact with you there. Um, we are, we have finished the wisdom literature last week and now we're heading into the prophets and prophecies and and in our uh christian bibles the prophets are split into two parts what we call the major prophets and the minor prophets um the major prophets are isaiah uh jeremiah uh lamentations is is grouped in there because jeremiah probably wrote that Ezekiel, and we include Daniel, whereas our Jewish friends put Daniel in the writing section. Um, they don't put them in the prophets section, uh, largely because Daniel was written during the exile, towards the end of the exile, and uh, also because there's a, a good chunk of it that's written in Aramaic. But Christians put Daniel as part of that because Daniel has a lot of prophetic things to say, and we're going to get into that uh, a little bit later on. But first I want to talk about prophecy as, as a general. And there's a big difference between prophecy in the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, and prophecy in the New Testament or the New Testament scriptures. In the Old Testament, prophecy is speaking usually to a rebellious king or a rebellious people. Um, in the Old Testament, prophets were rare and unusual. It wasn't anybody that could be a prophet there were certain specific individuals that were called to be prophets god used prophets for a specific time and for a specific thing they brought the word of the lord in other words it this was scripture when they spoke it was scripture and the point the people uh, the, it was to point the people to repentance obedience to the law, and devotion to Yahweh. That was always the point of the prophets. Point people to repentance, obedience to the law, and devotion to Yahweh. Now, New Testament prophecy is a little bit different. If you read 1 Corinthians, when we get to Paul's letters, we're going to talk about this a little bit more. New Testament prophecy is, is much, much different in that prophecy is spoken to individuals to build up and strengthen each other and the church. It isn't to accuse. It isn't to tell people to repent and, and turn back. Sometimes it is. But the main goal is to build up and edify. The Holy Spirit is in every single Christian believer. So in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew scriptures, the Spirit of God was either in the tabernacle or in the temple or not present at all. At times, the spirit or the ruach of God fell upon a person, such as Elijah or Elisha or Isaiah or any of the other, other prophets. Sometimes, for a period of time, the spirit of God would rest on them, but the spirit of God didn't reside as a permanent place in a person's life. It wasn't until the birth, death, resurrection, assumption of Jesus into heaven, and then the sending of the Holy Spirit to each and every single believer that the Spirit of God dwells in each person. So if you are a believer in Jesus, the same Holy Spirit that resided in the tabernacle, the same Holy Spirit that resides, that resided in the, the temple, the same Holy Spirit that led Israel in the desert, the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is in you. The presence of God is in you. And if the presence of God is in you, why wouldn't he speak to you? And why wouldn't he use you to speak encouragement to others. Prophetic gifting can be used throughout the life of a, believer, of a believer. They bring people who have the gift of prophecy, and I believe every believer has the ability to speak prophetically to others, but some have a particular gift for prophecy. But these folks bring a word from the Lord, not the word of the Lord. It's not scripture, but it's to be judged by scripture. 
So if somebody says, I have a word from you that I think is from the Lord, and it's something that's completely against Scripture, eh, throw it away. But if it aligns with Scripture and it resonates with your soul, this could really be God trying to get your attention, using this person to get your attention. New Testament prophets point people to Jesus, period. If it doesn't point you to Jesus, it's not prophetic. So let me give you an example. I started going to a church a few years ago um, that believed in the gift of prophecy, and there were a couple of people attending the church at the time who were very gifted prophetically. And the first day, I was the first Sunday I was at this church, he came up to me and he put his hand on me and he said, I have a word from the Lord for you. I'm like, okay, let's hear it. He says, and he did it very humbly. He said, if this resonates with you, great. If not, just let me know and that's okay. I, I really appreciated that when he said that. But he said, when I see you, I see the show American Pickers and how there's a whole bunch of different things that are coming to a line and that God is going to use all of these different things that seem to be not connected, but they're going to connect them all together. And boy, he was right. I've, I've led a life of many different things. Um, I've worked in the mall. I've worked with uh, mentally challenged people. I was a nurse for a good number of years in the 90s. I've been in the software industry. I've done prison. I've done all kinds of really neat things. And now it's all coming together in this ministry that God is calling me to. Prophecy in the New Testament builds people up. But we're talking about Old Testament prophets, aren't we? So the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. The minor prophets, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Jonah. Is that really a prophetic book? We'll talk about that. Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Or if you're telling, Malachi. I'm kidding, it's Malachi. When you're reading the prophets, and I think people get bogged down in prophets because they can be a little weird. They do a lot of weird stuff. They say a lot of weird things. But here's the key to understanding the prophets. It's understanding when they prophesy. So let's take Isaiah as an example. I'm going to read Isaiah 1.1. 1, 1. The vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah the son of Amos saw during the reigns of King Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz and Hezekiah of Judah. That's really important. Why? Because one, we learn, he's prophesying to the kings of Judah. Two, here are the kings, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Some are good, some are not good. And this shapes how we understand what Isaiah is saying to them because of the time period and the type of king they were and where they ruled. Isaiah is also mentioned in the historical books, mentioned in 2 Kings 19, 2 through 6, uh, and 20, uh, chapter 21 through 19. This is when Hezekiah was king. Also 2 Chronicles 26, 22, when Uzziah was king, and then chapter 32, verses 20 and 32, again, when Hezekiah was king. So when you read those passages, you get an understanding of what Isaiah's job was. So Isaiah had two messages, and there's two messages in his book. And there is a feeling that Isaiah actually did write chapters 1 through 39, but chapters 40 through 46 may have been written by his school or his disciples after he died and after they went into exile. But we're going to get to that in a second. Let's start with uh, the first section, and that's writings about judgment, and that's chapters 1 through 39. Assyria and Babylon will devastate and exile the people. This is something that Isaiah says over and over again. Chapters 1 through 39, the repeating theme is the old Jerusalem 
which is corrupted by idol worship and pagan practices, is purified by fire, leading to a new Jerusalem of obedience and devotion to Yahweh with justice and peace. There's the temple vision in chapter 6. Let me just read a little bit of that because it's so, it's so interesting. Let's go to chapter 6. So when is this happening? In the year King Uzziah died, okay, I saw the Lord seated on a high and lofty throne, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphim were standing above him, and they each had six wings, with two that were covered their faces, and two they covered their feet. With two they flew, and they called one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. His glory fills the whole earth. The foundations of his doorways shook and the sound of their voices and the temple was filled with smoke. And then I said, woe is me for I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips and live among a people of unclean lips. And because my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of armies. So when we get into Revelation, think of this because John is using a lot of this imagery in his writing of Revelation. So this is the temple vision that Isaiah has, and it, it, he is commissioned in chapter 6 for his prophetic ministry. And this is another thing that we kind of need to buy into when we're reading prophetic literature. It's not set up neatly linear this happened then this happened then this happened then this happened there's chapters one through five probably happened after chapter six but the way the book is arranged it's flowing with meaning as opposed to narrative okay so the themes that isaiah is building in chapters one through 39 is more important to him than following a timeline so during Ahaz, Isaiah stated that Yahweh is going to send a new king. All right, so let's go with chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Isaiah said, listen, house of David, is it not enough for you to try the patience of men? Will you also try the patience of God? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. See, a virgin will conceive, have a son, and name him Emmanuel. God is with us. Hmm. That is a definite prophetic announcement of Jesus. Uh, chapter 9, verse 6. Let's look at that. Going to verse 6. For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be upon his shoulders. He will, na he will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Um, if you've ever listened to Handel's Messiah, this is, this is my favorite praise and worship song ever. It is the 12th uh, section of the first movement. For unto us a child is born, a son will be given, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Um, one last one, chapter 11. Okay, verses 1 through 5. Then a shoot will grow up from the stump of Jesse. A branch will come from his roots, will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel and strength, a spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. His delight will be the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes. He will not execute justice by what he hears with his ears, but he will judge the poor righteously and execute justice for the oppressed of the land. He will strike the land with a scepter from his mouth, and he will kill the wicked with a command from his lips. Righteousness will be a belt around his hips. Faithfulness will be a belt about his waist. So Isaiah is talking about Messiah here. Messiah, the anointed one, Meshiach. Um, chapters 13 through 27, he talks a lot about judgment for Assyria and Babylon 
and all of Israel's neighbors. Remember Genesis 12, 3. Those who curse you will be cursed. Those who bless you will be blessed. That's still true today. Every time you turn on the news and you see people protesting against Israel and anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, which is kind of the same thing, you know, that's, that's what he's talking about there. Judgment for Assyria and Babylon even though God used these wicked nations to bring judgment to Israel because they harmed Israel, because they were a curse to Israel, they too were cursed. They were, God allowed them to do what was in their nature that they wanted to do, which was conquer and destroy Israel. Chapters 28 through 39 talk about the rise and the fall of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is saved from the Assyrians because Hezekiah humbles himself before God. And we talked about that when we talked about Kings and Chronicles. After Hezekiah shows them all of Israel's wealth, so now he's bragging, he's not bragging about Yahweh, he's bragging about his wealth, Isaiah predicts that Babylon will attack and overthrow Jerusalem. 100 years later in 2 Kings 24 through 25, this actually happens. So if we we're left with just chapters 1 through 39. Well, it'd be pretty dark. But we have chapters 40 through 40, 40 through 66. And this could very well have been written by followers of Isaiah's prophecies um, during and after the exile, uh, probably maybe during Ezra and Nehemiah's time. They were written in the tradition of Isaiah's prophetic ministry. So if we go to chapter 8, verse 16, we get a glimpse into what that looks like. So chapter 8, verse 16, bind up the, te bind up the testimony. He's talking about his prophecy. Seal up the inst instruction among my disciples. Now, Isaiah is not talking about God's disciples. He's talking about his disciples, the people who are with him. And it says, I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. I will wait for him. So there's an indication here that Isaiah kind of wanted his prophecies to, especially the doom and gloom ones, to be bound up and saved by a special group of disciples that would follow him from generation to generation. And then when we get to uh, chapter 30, Verses 8 and 9, let's read that real quick, because that's a little bit further on, isn't it? Go now, write it on a tablet in their present, and inscribe it on a scroll. It will be for the future, forever and ever. There are rebellious people, deceptive children, children who do not want to listen to the Lord's instruction. So, again, there's an indication here that, that because of Israel and Jerusalem's rebelliousness against God that Isaiah wants to pack it up and keep it for generations and open it later. Now, what do we do when we open it later? That's for next week. Boy, it's been good talking with you today. If you like this video, please like and subscribe and uh, put some comments, share the video. We'd love to, I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to uh, see what you're thinking about all of these things. We're going to continue with Isaiah and the rest of the major prophets next week. But until then, God bless.